Welcome to my presentation, Low Voltage EBIC Investigation of Fails. My name is Andreas Rummel and I work for Kleinding Nanotechnik. The work I will be presenting today was performed in close collaboration with Greg Johnson from Zeiss as well as our colleagues. The motivation for the work I will be describing was to determine whether electron beam induced current analysis at low beam voltages can be used to locate failures in an SRAM transistor. We started by attempting to record SE and EBIC data from a 7 nanometer device at low acceleration voltages down to 30 volts. However, it turned out that images of good quality could be taken down to approximately 70 volts. In principle, lower beam voltages are possible. However, the time to adjust the beam increases and no additional information that was relevant to this investigation was produced. In addition, live imaging becomes rather difficult at acceleration voltages below 70 volts, especially placing the probes on the desired contacts. And as we will see during this talk, the beam current drops significantly at acceleration voltages below 100 volt. This has a detrimental effect on the imaging and on the EBIC, EBIC signal yield. During other tests with electron beam induced resistance change, referred to as EBIRGE, we found out that the EBIC result changed after creating failures by overstressing transistors. And this was the starting point of the work I'll be discussing today. My presentation can roughly be divided into five sections. First, I will describe the SE images and the EBIC data obtained at beam voltages between 70 and 500 volts from an undamaged SRAM transistor. After generating a failure between the gate and source of an NMOS device, we recorded SEM images and EBIC data at the same location. In the third step, we verified the failure doing eBurge and subsequently compared the results from before and after stressing the device. After presenting the recorded data, I will walk you through a comparison of the obtained results before and after generating the failure and discuss the outcome. The setup used can be seen here. The Klein Dig Nanotechnic PS8 Probo Shuttle on the left hand side was loaded into a Zeiss Gemini SEM300 that can be seen on the right. We used a commercially available TSMC 7 nanometer device for the experiments and the exposed contact pads were dressed using the probe tips with 10 nanometer radius supplied by Mesoscope. The video shows the loading process of the probe shuttle. Just a few words on the requirements for this analysis. Since the EBIC images were taken at very low beam voltages on small structures using frame acquisition times of up to several minutes, both the nanoprobing platform and microscope have to exhibit very good stability and provide low noise signal leads. These features are crucial for this application. Before we start with the analysis, just a few words on the methods we employed. EBIC electron beam induced current is a method that uses the electron beam to visualize PN junctions that are present in almost any semiconductor device. As the electron beam penetrates several micrometer into the sample, even buried PN junctions can be located and analyzed. Here we can see an overview of this method. Whenever the electron beam hits the depletion zone of a PN junction, electron hole pairs are generated. Depending on the beam voltage, several hundred electron hole pairs can be generated by one incident primary electron. The liberated electrons can be picked up by a probe tip and fed back into the video input of an SEM after being suitably amplified. By superimposing the obtained EBIC data on the corresponding SE image, the location of the PN junctions can be visualized. Electron beam absorbed current EBAC is similar to EBIC. In contrast to EBIC, this method does not rely on the presence of PN junctions. Rather, the probe tip simply collects those electrons that reside in the contact in metal lines 
without being amplified by the generation of electron hole pairs. EBEC is often used to visualize opens or shorts in metal line connections. While EBIC and EBEC are passive methods, electron beam induced resistance change, eBridge, applies a voltage to locate a failure. The voltage is applied to force a current through the failure, which is destabilized such that the current and resistance at the failure changes when the electron beam scans the failure site. The resistance change is recorded and the respective image is superimposed on the SE image. eBridge is often used to locate low ohmic shorts in parallel structures where passive methods fail. This is the first set of SE images taken at acceleration voltages between 70 and 500 volt. They were recorded with a frame time of 2.7 minutes. Large differences are not present in the images. Of course, the contrast at 500 volts is slightly better, but even at 70 volts, all of the contacts on the 7 nanometer SRAM can be seen clearly. Slight differences are visible at 100 volt and 70 volts, where shadow can be seen around the probe needle. The probe needle is landed on one of the SRAMs inverter gates. The inverter gate shares the same contact with the drain of the connected PMOS and NMOS. The next set of images are the corresponding EBIC images. While we hardly see anything at 70 volts, the EBIC signal from the contacted gate and the neighboring gate show up. At 150 volt and 200 volt, we already clearly see all transistor contacts that share the same well light up. And at 500 volts, we can also see contacts from neighboring wells. One comment regarding the measured EB currents at 100 volt, the differences between the maximum and minimum current is only about 30 picoamps. Next, we created a failure between the contacted gate and the source of the connected NMOS transistor by applying a NOVA voltage. During the stress, a maximum current of 160 nanoamps flowed between the two contacts, causing a measurable but not visible failure. On the right hand side, we can see an overview of the SRAM NMOS, where the contacted gate is shown in green and the two fins of the NMOS are drawn as red lines. Both gate and fins are below the metal contacts and are not visible at the surface. The active area with P and N doped silicon is marked in yellow and blue. On the left hand side we see the eBridge image taken to verify the defect and visualize its location. The best result was obtained at a beam voltage of 500 volts. We actually observed two spots, the brightest one close to the second fin as can be deduced by comparing the right image. The next set of images are the corresponding EBIC images after creating the failure. At a first glance, we see the gate light up in addition to the gate contact as well as its neighboring gate. A closer look reveals a more drastic change of the complete structure seen in the next image. Let us now have a closer look at this change and select two images taken at 150 volt beam voltage, one before and one after the blow. The change is most obvious at beam voltages of 150 volt and 200 volt. Firstly, we see that after the blow, the gate contact lights up with less intensity, whereas the gate itself is much more visible than before the blow. In addition, before the blow, all the PFET contacts are brighter than the NFET contacts. Especially the NFET ground contacts are dark. This applies to both the inverter ground, labeled G and D, and the bitline ground, labeled BL in the image. After the blow, the NFET contacts, ground and BL, light up and are even brighter than the bitline gates. This was the first indication that the short has likely gone to the well. To sum up, we can see a strong change in the EBIC results after creating the failure and the question arises, can we use EBIC instead of eBridge to verify and locate, locate failures? Or is there a correlation between EBIC and eBridge? In order to answer this question, we examine the following. 
the maximum EB currents quantitatively, then the location of the maximum EB currents, the maximum sensitivity as a function of beam voltage. This is necessary as we have seen that the maximum change of the EBIC image occurs at beam voltages between 150 volts and 200 volts, whereas the e bridge spot is best visible at beam voltage at a beam voltage of 500 volts. Finally, we examine the electron beam shape with Monte Carlo simulations to provide an explanation for the differences in beam voltage and we studied the contribution of EBAC electrons to image generation. Both maximum current and failure location can be deduced from the eBridge measurement. In, order, in contrast to eBIC, eBridge measures the location of the maximum resistance change, while eBIC measures the current from electron hole pairs generated in PN junctions. An analysis of the maximum EB current was done using a dedicated analysis tool that allows superimposing the EB data on the recorded SE image. The images here show a current measurement across the failing gate, while the next slide shows the corresponding measurement along the gate. For these measurements, we have used the images taken at a beam voltage of 200 volts as they showed the strongest gate signals. We also analyzed the current changes of healthy gates to account for differences in electron beam current or any other cause that might change the measured EBIC current. While the non-failing gate shows an increase of approximately 20 picoamps, the failing fins show an increase of 70 picoamps before and after overstressing the device. An additional measurement of the beam current was done to make sure that images taken at different beam voltages are comparable. The beam current is rather stable at acceleration voltages between 150 volt and 500 volts. It only changes from 147 picoamps to 150 picoamps at these beam voltages. At acceleration voltages below 100 volt, it drops to only 84% of the beam current at uh, 150 volts and at 70 volt the current drops to 56% of the value at 150 volt. A look at the EBIC images taken before and after overstress st stressing the transistor shows that we have a maximum current change at beam voltages between 150 volt and 200 volt. On the other hand, the best EBIC image was taken at an acceleration voltage of 500 volt. Comparing these two images, we see a strong correlation of the maximum measured currents. While we have two smaller maxima in the eBridge image, there are no corresponding smaller maxima visible in the eBIC image. In order to, exp to explain the observed correlation and the differences, we investigated whether the beam diameter is large enough to generate enough eBIC electrons at low acceleration voltages. While the electron beam has a diameter of 10 to 20 nanometer in silicon at 500 volt, it is limited to about 1 to 2 nanometer at 100 volt. As a result, the electrons must be driven by an internal electrical fields rather than a large beam diameter reaching the active area at low kV. By the way, the simulations were done for silicon and the material out of which the contacts are made, likely cobalt or maybe tungsten, will have a higher ordinal number and thus even smaller scattering volume than those shown here. The EBIC image doesn't seem to result from the electron beam penetrating the failure. Neither does it result from EBAC electrons that remain in the contacts and are detected by the EBIC amplifier. This can be deduced from the fact that these contacts would firstly appear dark because of the emitted secondary electrons and secondly only the contacted pad would be light up. It looks as if the failure causes a change in the active region such that internal fields resulting from PN junctions are changed and thus change the EBIC currents that are sensitive to these internal fields. Conclusion 
An EBIC investigation at low beam voltages has shown a correlation between the position of the EBIC spot and the location of the maximum EBIC current. So the difference in beam voltage of the observed EBIC and EBIC result was investigated. And as a result, the root cause of the damage seems to be a change in the electrical field generated by the underlying PN junctions. Thank you for attention.